In part one, I discuss which systems I consider to be retro game systems and my theory that the term classic games is more appropriate, but we're stuck with the term retro games. So what are the best ways to play them? The options are original games and original hardware, original game cartridges or discs and playing them on original hardware, price medium cost to very, very expensive. I started collecting older games in the late 90s until about 2005, and I consider it to be the golden age of retro video game collecting because it's back when older games were just considered old, but before they were considered to be collectible and very valuable. But then I made the poor choice to sell my game collection before I moved. I regret doing that to this day because there is no way on God's green earth that I could ever recreate it and I'm not even going to try. I'm currently mostly collecting import cartridges and the only domestic American game cartridges that I buy were either specific to the American region or had significant localization differences. So through decades of eBay, price charting, and this whole collecting for profit mishugana, there has definitely been constant inflations to the price of used retro games and it has definitely turned me off to collecting American games. Who knows if the bubble is going to burst or if we're going to see a slight de-escalation. But if you want to get an NES and start collecting some original NES cartridges, it can be affordable as long as you stick to the most common games that are readily available. Don't even get me started on how expensive it is to collect games complete in box or the insanity that is graded games. If you go down the deep, dank, dark, rare game rabbit hole, or even some of the more popular games that have gone up in price, then it is going to get very, very expensive very quickly. And it wasn't always like that but we're unlikely to go back to anything like the good old days of collecting games back when they were just considered old. Accuracy. 100% accurate. Playing a game on the original hardware that it was meant to be played on is the baseline and the gold standard. However, you're also inheriting all of the possible technical issues. Having NES cartridges that failed to connect, dead batteries, Failing optical drives and disk drives, dead capacitors, are all of the less wonderful things that you have to deal with by dealing with original game hardware. Convenience, medium to low. Cartridges can take up a lot of physical space, especially if you want to display them and make them look all nice. Time, it can be very, very time consuming. For some people who hunt for original cartridges, it can take years of looking to get what they're after. A lot of game collectors enjoy the hunt, but then are you enjoying the actual playing of the games or the competitive hunting nature of buying the games? Nostalgia, 100%. There is absolutely nothing more nostalgic than putting a game cartridge for a system that you remember from your youth and putting it into that game system and turning it on and seeing that game display on your TV, especially if you're using a CRT TV instead of a modern LCD TV. Collecting original games and playing them on original hardware isn't for everybody, but for those that are into it, there's nothing like it. Official emulation collections on modern hardware platforms. Some game publishers have been putting together collections of their retro games for modern hardware such as the PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox One and Series, Nintendo Switch, and Windows PCs. And there are some excellent companies that have been helping them do just that, such as M2 and Hamster. Price. It's a really good deal if you're just getting a basic copy of the game collection. But if you're going off the deep end and getting a physical collector's edition with all the doodads, they can really get up there in price. Accuracy. Modern professionally made emulation collections have gotten very, very accurate and very convenient. Convenience. Some collectors love having physical copies. They really love getting their hands on a physical copy that has a classic retro game on it. 
Nintendo has stopped selling many of their classic games for their Nintendo Switch and instead only have their own Nintendo Online subscription service where you don't actually get to keep the games, but you're renting access to them. I have conflicting feelings about this. I think it's a great way for people that are already subscribing to the Nintendo Online service to get access to older games, but Nintendo seems to only be releasing a couple games at a time. But I don't like the fact that you don't actually get them forever. But for a lot of kids, this is the only way that they have gotten to play classic Nintendo games. I take issue with a lot of the modern emulators that have one button rewind and save states that take all the consequence of failure out of playing classic games. I think that it takes a lot of the fun out of it if you make it too easy. Time. Very quick. Instant gratification. An incredible rush of dopamine. Hamster has really done quite a lot to release classic arcade games in their arcade archives line. I really appreciate some of the more esoteric deep cuts that they have been putting into modern circulation. Nostalgia. I am a sucker for buying game collections over and over again, and I will probably hand Konami, Namco, Capcom, Sega, and many many more my hard earned cash to have classic retro games running on modern systems. I have no idea how many times I've purchased Mario, Sonic, Mega Man, and Street Fighter 2 over the years. It's a lot. Official Mini Emulator Console Systems I was just about to give Nintendo credit for starting the mini console boom, but then I remembered that Sega actually licensed various Sega games to at games who have been putting out crappy system-on-a-chip TV plug-in games consoles for a while now. But what Nintendo did is they made an official high-quality miniature console with decent emulation, high-quality industrial design, and a lot of good games. And then, in perfect Nintendo fashion, they didn't manufacture enough consoles to meet demand, and they didn't bother doing additional runs. The NES Classic Edition was very hard to find at times, and asses were trying to flip them for profit for their entire commercial run. However, their success brought about the Super Nintendo Classic Edition, the Sega Genesis Mini, TurboGrafx-16 slash PC Engine Mini, Neo Geo Mini, the Sega Astro City Mini, the Sega Astro City Mini V, and the Taito Egret 2 Mini, the Sega Genesis Mini 2, and then my favorite, the Neo Geo Arcade Stick Pro, that is both a mini console with 40 built-in Neo Geo fighting games and a controller. Sony also put out the PlayStation Classic, but did a lackluster job in doing it. Luckily, it is phenomenally easily hacked, and the PlayStation Classic is now known for having a plethora of easily expanded games on it. Price. Medium, when they were new, and now many, many consoles have gotten quite expensive for some of the rare ones. Accuracy. With the exception of the PlayStation Classic, a lot of them have been very, very accurate and are a great way to play classic retro games on a modern TV with HDMI. Convenience. Very high. Very convenient once you actually get them. Time. Once you actually get one, it's pretty easy to just plug the thing in and it works. Nostalgia. They deliver a high level of nostalgia. A lot of the controllers you use really feel great and these are official products that really have excellent industrial design. EverDrive and Optical Drive emulators on original game hardware. EverDrive is a popular brand of cartridge-based ROM loaders that will take an image of a game off an SD card and then will simulate the chips on the cartridge and then present the game to the console. The console has no idea that it's not playing on original cartridge. Later models used advanced FPGA technology and have gotten to be incredibly accurate and in supporting almost every single cartridge-based game. 
I have Everdrive for my Famicom, Super Famicom, N64, Game Boy Original slash Color, and Game Boy Advance. And I have a Terra Onion ODE device for my Genesis, PC Engine, and Sega Saturn. An optical drive emulator, or ODE, is a piece of hardware that simulates the optical disk drive in a disk-based game hardware and will present a disk image off an SD card to a game console. The game console will be none the wiser since the optical drive emulators can simulate all of the disk and data calls. However, installing some of them in a PlayStation 1, Sega Saturn, or Sega Dreamcast can be a little difficult and requires some basic understanding of electronics in order to get them installed and configured. Price medium to high. They vary in complexity and price, but expect to be between $150 to up to $200. But once you cover the cost of the device, they unlock the entire game library for that platform. Personally, I don't collect N64 cartridges because I have every single N64 game on my EverDrive. Once you get over the initial cost for the EverDrive, it makes playing every single game on that platform effectively free. They can also let you play fan translations and in independent homebrew games. Accuracy. I would say 100%. The game systems don't know that you're not using original games. Convenience. The insane amount of convenience is addictive because you can switch between games instantly and for old school video game nerds you can read about an obscure game and then boot it up and play it for yourself. I greatly enjoy watching other YouTube videos about obscure games and then playing them for myself on original hardware using my EverDrives without having to hunt down a physical copy of it. And there are some situations where dealing with a dying optical drive in a game system or dealing with failing hardware drives in a Famicom disk system that it's better and more reliable to fake it using an EverDrive or an ODE. Time. There is a time of getting the actual device, setting it up, and loading up your ROM set from a torrent or archive.org, but once you are good to go, it's quite the time saver. Nostalgia. Very, very high. It's not exactly the same thing as taking a cartridge and sticking it in your game system, but you do have to pop them out if you're going to alternate between EverDrive and cartridges. I also can't get over how aesthetically pleasing the N8 Famicom EverDrive is and how well it matches, even down to the Showa era accurate Japanese topography. Multicarts and bootlegs. Ever since the mid 1980s, there have been pirate game cartridges mostly made in China. The Nintendo Famicom was especially hit hard because it did not feature a lockout chip like the later NES. In the past decades, they have greatly increased in quality. A multi-cart game cartridge has multiple games on it, but in the past they were limited to games that did not require advanced memory mapper chips. Modern bootleg game makers can pretty much make copies of almost everything in the NES library and most Super Nintendo games except for the ones that require special chips. A bootleg or reproduction is a single game, but it can be pretty neat to have a reproduction copy if an original legitimate copy has gotten incredibly difficult to get. And there are some fan translations that are also available on cartridge. Price. Low to medium. Accuracy. Low to medium. The old versions are quite bad. The new ones are quite good. Convenience. Medium. It can actually be pretty convenient to have one cartridge that has hundreds of NES games on it and it can be a very efficient way to scratch a retro video game itch. Time. If you're going to order them directly from China off AliExpress, you can expect a couple weeks for them to show up. However, many are available on Amazon, but they're going to be more expensive because you're paying for global shipping and then you're paying a third-party reseller that is marking it up for profit. Nostalgia. Low to medium. There are some particularly cool ones that I enjoy that are over the top, featuring lightning and unicorns. 
check this one out. Clone systems, hardware clones, and emulation console systems. Clone systems that play original hardware come in two varieties. One is a system on a chip that recreates a close approximation of original hardware using a more cost-effective method of combining chips. Hyperkin makes a selection of these and they are quite good. Hyperkin also made a system called the Retron 5. It is a console that uses software-based emulators to play games off real cartridges. There is a Japanese system called the Retro Freak, which is also well thought of. Some hardware clone systems work with EverDrives and multi-cards, but the Retron 5 and Retro Freak do not. One of the big advantages about using a modern clone system is that many of them have HDMI output and they look quite good on modern HD TVs. Some of them even have AV output, so you can use them with a CRT TV. Price, medium. Accuracy. The hardware clones are pretty accurate for normal games. Multicarts and EverDrives tend to mostly work. The Retron 5 and the Retro Freak have excellent compatibility, but one of the trade-offs is that there's a couple of frames of delay using an emulator. Some people notice it and it doesn't bother some people. Software-based emulators also can use save states and game patches. Convenience. It, quite convenient. It is actually easier and cheaper to get a clone system that can display NES games on an HD TV than it is to get an original hardware to look good. Time. Quite quick actually. All you have to do is open up the box and hook them up. Nostalgia. Medium. These systems require you to actually have the cartridges that you want to play. You still have to get the cartridges and plug them in. I actually think clone systems are pretty good at hitting this sweet spot between a modern convenience and it still sort of feels like an old game system. FPGA projects such as Mister. In the past couple of years, Mister has really taken off. It is a project that recreates video game hardware using FPGA technology that is insanely fast and accurate with absolutely no lag. Instead of just having a software program act like a chip, they are actually recreating hardware on a chip-by-chip -chip level using reprogrammable gate arrays. Price. Quite expensive. There seems to be quite a lot of hardware required and it's not cheap. Accuracy. Insanely accurate. Absolutely no lag. And the accuracy and the libraries of supported game hardware in games is growing on a daily basis. Convenience. I'm sure once you get it all set up, it's great. It actually sounds like quite the hobby, and I haven't really had the time to put into it. Time. See my previous point. Nostalgia. FPGA is for people who are looking for the absolute best way to play retro games, and they're willing to do so without the original hardware but they're willing to make the investment into FPGA tech to do so. They really have come a long way in a short period of time, and I can't wait to see what the technology is going to look like in a couple years. Software emulators on PC and Mac. People have been writing programs to play console video games on PCs for decades. This actually goes back to the 1990s. Advancements in computing power has allowed for high-level emulation to be accurate and can run some games even better than original hardware with higher resolution and frame rates. Price. Low, as in free. And about the only cost that you're going to ensue is getting a decent compatible retro gamepad and they're actually getting pretty good and pretty cheap these days. Accuracy, quite high. Convenience. It's pretty convenient if you primarily use a laptop or a desktop PC. Personally, I like playing video games on televisions and I like to curl up on the couch with a good game. Some people will get PCs that hook up to their TVs just for this. Time. It's a small time investment, but once you get the games and you're familiar with the emulators, 
Not only can you switch between the games, but systems with a click of a mouse. Nostalgia. I'm actually going to rate it a little lower, not unless you were involved with the emulator scene back in the 90s. It's not particularly nostalgic, but you can still get access to the games that you want to play. I also want to give a shout out to the people that like to use cracked Nintendo Wii's, 3DS's, PSP's, and PS Vita's to run emulators. I'm very impressed, but it's not for me. But I just wanted to say that it's a thing. Software emulators on Raspberry Pi, or RetroPi. For the past couple years, I have been a Raspberry Pi user, and I greatly enjoy having a RetroPi. This is a distribution of software running on a very small, very affordable Linux-based embedded computer system that can recreate almost every single 2D game system, 2D arcade game, and even PlayStation 1 and N64. Price. Medium. They're not as phenomenally cheap as they were back during the Raspberry Pi 3 era, but you can get a Raspberry Pi 4 based RetroPi for under $150. Accuracy. Very, very accurate with pretty good frame rates. With the right settings, there's almost no frames of lag if you're not overdoing it in the graphical settings. Convenience. It is incredibly convenient to be able to sit down on my couch and play pretty much every single retro video game from the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, including some of the very obscure rare Japanese stuff with just a couple clicks on the controller. I'm probably never going to have a Sega SG-1000 system, but I can play SG-1000 games easily on my RetroPie. Time. There can be a bit of a learning curve for getting used to the RetroArch software, and if you have a friend to help set one up for you, you can shave a lot of time off. Nostalgia. There actually are some pretty good CRT filter options, and I got a Raspberry Pi case that resembles a Super Famicom. I mean, I know it's not the real thing, but it can do a pretty darn good job at scratching that retro itch. Software emulators on handheld emulation systems. In the past couple years, there has been a plethora of really good embedded Linux systems using RetroArch. In the past, I've had a BitBoy, a Mew Mini, and now I have a Mew Mini Plus. Accuracy. Pretty accurate. If you're going to install Onion OS or Garlic OS, there really are some great fan-created software packages out for playing games on these little devices. Price. Shockingly affordable. I got a Mu Mini Plus for $66. Not bad for something that can play every single PlayStation 1 game and every single Sega CD game in the palm of your hand. Not bad at all. Convenience. There's just something super awesome about having retro video games on a portable handheld form factor, especially if you're playing portable retro games. I currently do not have a Neo Geo Pocket or a Game Gear, but I definitely enjoy playing them on my Mio Mini Plus. Time. You can either stick with the default software distribution and not spend any time on it, or install an updated firmware and get all you can out of Onion OS. If you know what you're doing, it's really not a lot of time at all. Nostalgia. These are the handheld emulator devices that Nintendo and Sega needs to get off their butt and make. I know it's not original hardware, but it still feels so incredibly good in your hand. Official software stores on old download systems. Over the years, I've spent a lot of Wii points on my Wii Virtual Console collection. And then I moved it on to my Wii U. And I'm a sucker for buying the same games over and over again on my 3DS Virtual Console. There are also quite a lot of PlayStation 1 classics that I have purchased on my PlayStation 3 and I have then also loaded them up on my PSP Go and my PS Vita. Nintendo would actually customize the emulators to make sure that the games ran quite well on the Wii Virtual Console. Price, medium range. It adds up, 
but it's all sort of pointless now considering Nintendo has closed the Wii shop, the Wii U shop, the 3DS shop, and Sony has delisted de a lot of the PS1 classics on the PlayStation 3 store. The PSN PS3 store is still open, but it's a little tricky because you have to use the website to put money on your account. But it's a good option instead of going down the Nintendo route when they just close the entire store. Accuracy. Medium. They ran well, but they sort of had this early 2000 emulator aesthetics where they tried to make everything smooth instead of having nice, sharp, crisp pixels. Convenience. It's not that convenient these days because you still have to deal with a Wiimote, and I'm glad that all the software that I paid for is still on my systems, but it's going to be a sad, sad day when the systems stop working eventually, even after the servers are all offline. Time. Shopping on the Wii Store was not quick. Nostalgia. I'm actually nostalgic for the Wii Virtual Console, and I still find myself humming the Wii Shop tunes, and I have a Wii Shop remix in rotation on my music playlist. Conclusions The way that I have played retro games has changed over time, and recently I have found myself using a different combination of these. I used to be big into collecting original cartridges, and then I went back to college, and then I sold my previous collection. And then I got into emulators, and exclusively used emulators for a while. And now I'm back into collecting some original cartridges. And years later, I deeply enjoy playing games in some combinations of original hardware and on an original CRT TV, in addition to a modern 4K TV. Whichever method works for you is valid. The things that people enjoy are highly subjective, and that includes how they choose to enjoy those things. I firmly believe that there is no one correct way to play classic retro video games, and there is no correct way to enjoy them. If it's fun for you, it's fun for you. And if people do things differently, well, good for them. That's valid for them as well. The entire thing reminds me of juvenile arguments on the school grounds in the late 1980s between those kids whose parents chose to buy them Sega systems and those kids who had Nintendo systems, and the one weird kid who swore his fealty to the NEC Turbo Graphics. The similarities were greater than the differences between them. And it doesn't really matter how you enjoy your retro video games, just that you do. Everyone has different criteria, different resources, and has had different experiences. So, which option is the best way to play retro video games? Whichever one works for you is the best option, and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. This is 8 Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro.